welcome. We are so glad that you have joined us online, Latonia Baptist Church. We're going to sing some songs. We'd love for you to join with us in worship.
Hi, my name is Dan Francis. I'm the pastor at Latonia Baptist Church, and I welcome you to our online worship service on May the 24th. We are deep into uh, the book of Acts. We're at chapter 24. We're going to look at uh, the verses 22 through 27. And the issue, and the, the theme of today is the fear of faithfulness. Think about what you might be afraid of and relate that somehow to your faith experience. What is it about your faith that bothers you? Last week we talked about the courage of being faithful. Um, but this week we really try to wrap that around in a different way. And so are we afraid of the righteousness of God? Are we afraid of the self-control that God might want and expect of us? Or perhaps are we afraid of the judgment of God? I think we will find that as we look into the life, and I'm going to show you the, the genealogy, the family tree here of Drusilla and Felix. And now we're not going to go into it a lot, but you will see on here Drusilla and Felix. Felix has been married three times, or he's going to be, his third wedding is going to be with Drusilla. She will have been his second uh, wife. Uh, and notice what happens here in this particular overview. He left Paul in prison. We're going to look at that might reference back to it, but notice where she is from. She is connected to the Herodians, and so there is a connection even back as far as Herod the Great and, uh, and Herod Antipas, and, you know, the, they part, played a part in the killing of Jesus, played a part in the uh, killing of John the Baptist. And so uh, we're going to look at verses 22 through 27, but Felix having a more exact knowledge about the way that that's referencing uh, Christian faith, put them off. That's an important thing that he does often. He doesn't like to make decisions. Say when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will decide your case. And then he gave orders to the centurion for him to be kept in custody. And yet for some freedom and not to prevent any of his friends from ministering to him. But some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about the faith that he had in Jesus Christ. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present. When I find time, I will summon you. And at that same time, too, he was hoping that money would be given him by Paul. Therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and, and converse with him. Verse 27, and after two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So he didn't ever really ultimately deal with him. So he's kind of a guy that you think about as about how to pass the buck, because he certainly did that. So we're going to talk about three people today, Drusilla, Felix and Paul. We've looked a little bit at the relationship there and the genealogy. We won't need to go back to that, but just know that it's there and know that it's something that we're going to reference from time to time because Drusilla and Felix were curious to hear what this faith experience for Paul. Paul now a missionary for some 25 years and now he'd, he'd come to Jerusalem and in fact was arrested and now brought to Caesarea for, uh, as a prisoner. And so here he is summoned before them and the Roman government, you remember the Pax Romana, they were interested in, um, you know, in religion and particularly wanted to reduce religion because they were more interested in government control. And so they wanted the ultimate peace. And one of the ways to do that was to subtract religion from that. But you'll also remember that when John the Baptist inserted religion into that uh, governmental process and began to see judgment, uh, he literally uh, lost his life over that. So we're going to be looking at what we have focused on there in verse 25. He says, but he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. Felix became frightened and said, go away to the present. When I find time, I will summon you. So first point we want to make is why did talk about righteousness cause fear in Felix? Because any times God's ideal is placed on us, we are uncomfortable with that. Let me give you as quick an overview as I possibly can about what Jesus would have expected. Jesus had some high ethical expectations of his followers. And so as Paul would tell them that, he certainly would bring a certain level of fear to them about the expectations that 
God through Christ had set for them. And Felix was a man of Greek education. He had had a sense of justice. So the word righteousness would not be unusual for him. So how many times have you personally felt the cheers of people, the need for significance in that kind of setting, or the lure of money and the appearance of success? How many times have those things, in fact, influenced you and given you um, perhaps uh, interfered with your ability to think about a sense of justice and what was right. So what we want to do is reflect on the righteousness as we see it in the kingdom of God through the provision of Jesus. Now that relate, relates to Matt, uh, Matthew 5 and the Sermon on the Mount. That's probably the the closest we'll get to that. Now we're not going to look at that passage, but we're going to reflect on it because all through there, he is challenging us to live at a different level and over and over again. But he ends with a huge punchline. <clears throat> As he's been reflecting, you know, they have expected you to do this, but I want you to do this. He is he's challenging them to go beyond it and to, and to dig deeper into it. Matter of fact, early, about midway in chapter 5, verse 20 of Matthew, he says, for I tell you, unless you exceed the righteousness of that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never in, enter the kingdom of God. So he was challenging them. But what was the challenge? The punchline of what he's saying there in uh, chapter 5 is, you shall be perfect as your heavenly father. So what in the world does he mean by that? that that's been coming up a little bit uh, fairly often. Some people thought it was high, you know, just hyperbole. Some people said that it's literal and and we have to throw ourselves on the mercy of God. Some people say it's impossible, but you just try anyway. Some people say it was just for his inner, inner few people. Some people even said that it was, wasn't really a command, but it was a promise that ultimately would only come true as we came to know Christ in the afterlife. But perfect, when you understand it, it needs to be seen in the context of the nature of God, because that's what he's comparing it to. And the nature of God is that God loves us without interference. He shows no partiality. And so when he later talks about this, he's talking about it in relationship, in terms of relationships. And what he's saying is there can be no double uh, standard in your love for, for people. In other words, you have to love your neighbor, you have to love your enemies. Now, how would that impact you as you spoke to people, your neighbors? How, how would that impact you as you um, did your Facebook entries. How would that impact you? He's saying you need to be perfect and complete. And the way in which you and I do that, his kind of righteousness means that we love with God's nature. And God's nature says that we, in fact, will love without partiality. So that's the righteousness part. Let's move on to the second. Why do you talk about self-control? If you haven't seen the movie um, where Tom Hanks plays Mr. Rogers, you need to see it, A uh, Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. It is an incredible movie. I did not grow up with the influence of Mr. Rogers much, but he was quite, uh, you just can't help but be moved by the movie. But as I've been reading about him, one of the things that I found interesting was that he was a very, uh, he operated under a, a great deal of self-control. Matter of fact, on all of his sweaters, on, on all of his clothes, at some level, you would see he had embroidered the number 143, and it was based upon I love you, the number of letters in the phrase I love you. He was a man that was literally, uh, I think we could say fairly, obsessed with self-control, and it was due to his religious faith. Let me give you some examples. He woke up every morning at 5 a.m., and he read from the Bible, and he read both the Greek and the Hebrew. He went to the Pittsburgh Athletic Club and swam a mile every morning. He had a kind of monkish lifestyle, and you never would have doubted anything about the fact that he certainly was a man of extreme self-control. One of the things that he said that I most like is, what do you do with the mad that you feel? And so what he was saying is there's a self-control, and if we're able to look at that and love with God's righteousness, his nature, then we'll get somewhere. And then point three, why did the talk about judgment bring fear in Felix? And, and God's judgment is an assessment. I just recently was moving some books, and I came across a book that I'm going to show you the title, the title of here. And I had forgotten about it. And I, I, interestingly, I, I find myself drawn to the books that are, have been most often given books, given as gifts to me. 
And this one has um, about a paragraph or so I want to read for you because it's about the judgment issue. Uh, as you see, it's by Henry Nowen, and he is a, a, a monk, and he had gone and heard an Advent message, a sermon uh, at Christmas. And so he is reflecting on that in this book. And this is what he says. He said, we should desire not only the first coming of Christ and the lowly human gentleness, speaking of Christmas, but also his second coming as the judge of our lives. He said, when I first heard that comment in an Advent sermon, I sensed the desire for Christ's judgment a key to my growing in holiness. And yet I realized how little I felt or cultivated that desire. And then he gets specific. Since it is not easy to, de to desire fervently this second coming and very hard to appear to prepare ourselves for the day of judgment, at least we ought to prepare ourselves by fear. And that was, that was the confusing punchline to me. But then he explains it in the next he says, yes, fear, because I've begun to see more clearly how part of Christian maturing is the slow, per persistent deepening of fear to the point where it becomes desire. In other words, it may start out as fear, which leads ultimately to respect, which leads ultimately to a desire. And he finishes by saying, the fear of God is not in contrast with divine mercy. Words such as fear and desire and justice and mercy have to be relearned and re-understood when we use them in talking about our intimate relationship with the Lord. Now, I began to parallel that. How do I understand that? How do I flush that sense of judgment out? I do it by thinking about my wife of these 40 plus years. My greatest human love experience is for my wife. And it is, as I reflected back, on a strange mixture of fear and love. Fear in that I would never want to disappoint her and love in that ultimately it is the fear of not wanting to disappoint her and the desire that I wanted to please her that ultimately I tie together my responsibility and my willingness to be judged by her. And so it's all tied together, I think, in my love for her. So I wonder what caused Felix and Drusilla to put off making a decision. What was it? The lure of money, the cheer of men, and, and the accolades of social uh, uh, connectedness? I don't know. It could be any or all of those things. But the most haunting line in this is, when I find time. When I find time. There's a word from the psalmist that says it well. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in thee. One of my uh, preacher buddies that I read from time to time says, uh, if you go to the National Gallery of Art, you can see two kinds of people. He says there are mere vagrants who are always on the move, making their way through the art gallery, passing from picture to picture without really ever seeing any of them. But then there are the students, he said. The students come in and they sit down and they meditate and they contemplate and they literally appropriate and saturate themselves with the, with the pictures, with the art. He said the vagrants, in fact, are, um, in respect of love to, to the Lord, they're, they're similar, like, they're similar to that. We have vagrants who, are, who see the Lord as a passing glimpse and, and their impression is not, is not deepening, it's not vital. But then he says there are those students who, who, who graze deeply and are continuing crying out, oh Lord, bring me the depths of your riches. And the Lord always responds, today. And we always respond, well, when I have time. When I have time. To me, those are the saddest words spoken in this story. Because they kept putting it off. Maybe they never intended to make the decision. Maybe they were always just going to wait for some money, a, br a bribe of sorts. But maybe it was real. Maybe... They, they put it off because they knew they saw something in Paul that was life-changing. Maybe it was because of his sense of righteousness, his self-control, and maybe the sense that he, in fact, had understood and dealt with God's judgment in a way that allowed him to live freely and deeply. I think it was probably all of those things. So wherever you are and wherever you find your faith experience today, don't put off what you know you need to do today. Don't wait till 
to when you find time. Do it today. Do it now. Do it right now. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks for times like these when we can set aside these moments, sing some songs, and lift the thought of your work in our lives to a new place. To think deep thoughts like, what would it, li- what would it be like to be God, to reach God's kind of righteousness? What would it be like to, to have more self-control in my life and to know that I stand in the judgment of God and I stand there gladly and redemptively? Be with us as we seek to live our lives today to its fullest and not put off anything until tomorrow. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I hope to see you soon. Oh, God.